the relationship uh, between uh, Hebrew Bible and uh, Christian thought I, is very much at the core of, of what we are doing. And uh, my relationship with Yoram is very important because his book on the philosophy of Hebrew scripture um, unraveled a lot of knots for me personally as a scholar, having uh, been someone who taught for years in the field of uh, philosophy of religion and religious epistemology. Here comes this uh, Jewish philosopher who basically in one book uh, undid a lot of the, the problems that uh, uh, Greek philosophy and Christian theological thought have, have been uh, having. And um, so one of the things that uh, I have, I've most appreciated um, about um, uh, Yoram's work and, uh, and, and the work of, of others is that it, uh, it reorients the way we think about culture. And um, I have a friend who's an African-American pastor in Louisville, Kentucky. I went to seminary with him. And he has a wonderful expression that uh, Christians do very well with the hallelujah, but what they desperately need is more do you luya. And um, <laughs> I feel that this is the fundamental problem between Greek and, and, um, uh, and Jewish thought is that Greek thought is very much about the hallelujah and uh, Jewish thought is much more about the do-ya-luya. And that is what we're in short supply of in, in, uh, Western, in Western culture. And for that reason, we, um, we, are, we are a majority set Christian college, uh, the King's College. Um, but we did change the uh, we did change the title in the curriculum from Old Testament to Hebrew Bible to begin reorienting our students as to the positional privilege of of Judaism in uh, forming the ideas uh, of the West. And um, I do realize that we have got, uh, I, I am an evangelical, I run in the circles of the evangelicals, although nobody knows who they are anymore, especially after the uh, 2016 election. Uh, the band has broken up. Uh, we don't have the <laughs> leaders. I, I sat next to a, um, uh, a um, hedge fund um, partner yesterday on the plane on the way back. Um, and he was saying, who are the evangelical leaders today? And uh, I said, nobody knows. So we don't have the Chuck Colsons and the, and the Billy Grahams uh, anymore. And I do realize that, as, as Yoram appropriately said, uh, we are in a situation that uh, we, don't, we, we don't have a lot of credibility because the first thing that comes up in uh, the average church-going uh, lay Christian's mind when they think about this conversation is, um, is uh, the preposition to the Jew first, which comes from Romans 1.16. And uh, what I want to be a harbinger of is a change of prepositions. Um, I think we need to reorient uh, the conversation to with the Jew first um, and see how far we can go uh, as far as that goes. And that's what we're trying to do uh, at the King's College and what I hope will be the beginning of a reorientation of, of uh, not only primary and secondary school education, but higher education that has uh, a touch point with uh, faith-based and Christian-based higher education. Uh, and I do so for convictional reasons, because when you apply the law of parsimony to the curriculum that we teach, and we teach Western civilization, we teach um, the core principles uh, upon which um, our society is based at King's. Our students have to take a very rigorous, as I said, Oxford politics, philosophy, and economics uh, curriculum. But when I apply the law of parsimony to what really matters in terms of how we actually live in Western society in general, and America in particular, most of the commonplaces that have created the culture that we want to keep and preserve and defend, which is presumptively why we are all in this room today, um, do come from 
the Jews. Um, Johann Herder once gave what I think is the best definition of culture ever given. He said, um, culture is the lifeblood of a people, the flow of moral energy that keeps a society intact. That is very different than civilization, which is the technical know-how and the means by which we keep the trains running on time and so forth. But when we look at, when we look at the, um, uh, the, the cultural deposit of the things that actually make up the society that we want to keep, um, I have to be candid as a, as a Christian and as a theologian, there's relatively little of what we talk about in our own curriculum at King's that is distinctive to the New Testament and to the, uh, to the Christian um, understanding of society. When we think about things like constitutionalism and limited powers of, of government, as Judaic studies professor William Scott Green has observed, those come from the covenants of uh, the Hebrew Bible. And um, uh, those are the principal features of uh, Western uh, democracy. Uh, as um, Howard J. Harold J. Berman has argued in his Magisterial Law and Revolution, the formation <laughs> of the Western legal tradition, he said, quote, it's impossible to understand the, West, the quality of the Western legal tradition without exploring its religious dimension. When we think about common ancestry and universal uh, human rights, when we think about human dignity and the sanctity of life, those are things that flow from uh, the Hebrew Bible that certainly the Christian tradition has uh, underscored rather than uh, effaced. Um, uh, we know that, that uh, the early Christian church's opposition to things like infanticide and abortion were uh, preceded by uh, Hebrew origins for the sanctity of human life. Um, and it was uh, Josephus who reminded us that uh, the law orders all the offspring to be brought up and forbids women either to cause abortion or to make away with the fetus. When it comes to other things that we now hold dear, all the things we love about uh, society that we want to defend, things like gender equality, uh, this is actually something that you have to go to the Hebrew Bible for. Seven of the uh, 55 biblical prophets were, were women, according to Judaism. That is not really prominently featured um, in the New Testament. And, uh, and, and so forth. And, and on and on, uh, I could go in enumerating those uh, virtues and those contributions of, uh, of um, Judaism to uh, the curriculum of, uh, of Western uh, civilization. And uh, when I am asked, especially in this environment, in the, in the technique generation in which parents who are sending their students to college challenge me on why we have still have a liberal arts curriculum. They say, what are the liberal arts? I always say that liberal arts are those disciplines that keep a society free from tyranny. Uh, they liberate. They keep us from being under uh, the boot heel of any uh, chieftain or suzerain or uh, potentate. And as I uh, read Yoram's book, The Philosophy of Hebrew Scripture, his, uh, his work on the ethics of the shepherd were transformational to me in terms of understanding what actually propels a society forward. And so now, thanks to, to, to Robert and, and others, uh, we are now able to send every year 55 students or so from the King's College to Israel. And yes, many of them are going because they want to reconnect with uh, the Holy Land and the origins of their faith. But I know when they come back, what they see is the sort of thing that makes uh, 
a society entrepreneurial and, and great. They're all uh, made to, to read uh, Startup Nation uh, uh, and uh, Let There Be Water. And uh, they, they get a, a, a new appreciation for how the modern state of Israel has uh, still and still is in keeping with this ethics of uh, the shepherd that uh, Yoram has, uh, has discussed and uh, underscored in, in his work. Um, the, the other thing that um, I think that uh, we, we have desperately needed to uh, move away from in terms of our own uh, curriculum, in terms of uh, being based in uh, Plato and Aristotle is to see as Yoram has pointed out, uh, Hebrew thought as philosophy and the Bible as philosophy rather than simply revelation, this uh, sharp divide between reason and revelation that has characterized so much of Protestant Christian thought um, throughout uh, American uh, history. And uh, that divide is rooted in something even deeper than that, which is this constant debate. Now, this is getting a little bit into internecine uh, um, epistemology in, in terms of Christian thought, but the divide and the debate between realism and nominalism in, uh, in, Christ, in the Christian theological tradition, and especially at, at, the, at the fulcrum of the Protestant Reformation, so much of our debates have been about which one of those two uh, worldviews um, is, uh, is, has primacy in terms of uh, con constructing a theory of knowledge. Um, what I have seen is uh, Hebrew Bible as philosophy is a way around uh, that impasse that I believe, as, as Robbie George from Princeton has said, has created this environment of Gnosticism in which uh, we, we now find ourselves in a place in which uh, I think there are now 57 different genders that are recognized by Facebook. Um, the newest one that I saw, and I am not making this up because my sister, who's a teacher in the Lexington County Public, Fayette County Public School, district in, in Kentucky showed me is uh, called Luna gender, uh, where one's gender changes with the phases of the moon. Uh, and I am, I'm told that, um, I, I'm told that, what's that? Yeah, well, yeah, um, werewolves of London, as, uh, as Warren Zevon uh, said. And so this, this is where we have come as a result of, of this uh, process. Um, so, uh, so what do we do? Um, I was asked to speak about uh, 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 Jews and the future of, of Christianity. I think that we as uh, leaders of Christian institutions, especially higher educational inst institutions, need to go back to the model of three ancient civilizations, but explicitly begin with Hebrew thought at the beginning of the curriculum and teach Western civilization uh, from that point of view, rather than beginning uh, with the Greeks, which is uh, what uh, virtually all of our schools uh, do. And um, to, to borrow an image from uh, Mark Elaine Uankin's uh, book on the, on the Haggadah, he uh, talks about how uh, uh, breaking the two pieces of matzah bread, and there's this empty space uh, in between the two, is a, is a recognition of a conversation that needs to happen uh, in explaining the Passover meal. And I think that what, we, what we've now seen is a breakdown of Western civilization in which there's this now this empty space of secularism, uh, a secularum. The, the original sense of that word is this you know, the secularum is the time uh, between the times. Um, and I think in that empty space, we need to uh, reorient um, our, our education back to beginning with um, uh, Hebrew thought. And uh, 
that must start at a at a curricular a level um, and teaching our students that um, uh, the the key things that we that bind us together as a culture are not the result of epistemological abstractions but more about the rituals and activities uh, that keep a uh, society intact. Um, in my convocation address to the King's College students um, at the beginning of this academic term, I pointed them to the, uh, to the work of, uh, uh, and life of Joseph. And my new favorite Bible verse is Genesis 39, 22, that roughly paraphrase said, if anything happened in that place, it was because Joseph got it done. And um, that is the legacy of, of Hebrew thought and witness to, um, to Christian higher education in particular and Christian education in general. And it is a great honor to be here with you. Um, the very first time I ever spoke in public uh, my father said there are two rules you have to remember about uh, public speaking that Yoram has gotten with this conference. Number one, the brain can only contain what the bottom can endure. And number two, if you can't strike oil in 20 minutes or less, quit boring people. So with that, I'll draw my comments to a conclusion, and we'll, I look forward to our conversation together. Thank you very much.